Well, it's great to have you here this morning. Let's stand and sing, sing to our great and wonderful God. Him, you heavens and all that's above. Praise Him, you angels and heavenly hosts. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Father, we do thank you that we can come here this morning to praise you. Lord, to lift up your name. Lord, we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. 
not trust is the sweetest frame but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, resting his righteousness alone. Hold us, I stand before the throne. Christ alone. Well, it's great to have you um, joining us this morning, and um, yeah, so welcoming all visitors that are travelling through the country and um, joining us at this time. It's great to have you with us. Uh, please stay at the end of the service for a cup of tea and morning tea just to um, catch up and get to know you, and for all the regulars too. It's good to see you here as well. Okay, um, just a few announcements. So next. Sunday after the service on the 21st we have our members meeting um, so all members all available members ask you to please attend and also non-members are also welcome to come along and to um, see and hear what goes on um, and if there's anything that you need raised or probably need to speak to Pastor Tim but it's probably too late for that everything's on the agenda now but yeah um, next Saturday is our bush barbecue um, so Please, um, you just bring your own meat and food that you want to eat um, with your family and um, bring a dessert to share. Uh, we'll supply the fire and the hot plate. So if you haven't been there, um, come and see me afterwards for directions. But yeah, just 13 Ks down Douglas Road and um, it's accessible by two-wheel drive. It's going to take a little bit easier, some of the uh, corrugations and that. But yeah, it's a great night. If you haven't been to one, you do not know what you're missing out on. Um, monthly prayer meeting, uh, also next um, Sunday night, meeting at the church at 7 p.m. for time of prayer. And so please feel free to come along with or anything that you'd like prayer for. Um, we have a young lady by the name of Narelle Moses who is moving back to Mount Isa at the end of September, beginning of October. Uh, she's in need of accommodation until she is able to find get herself established. And um, yeah, so... If you know of someone who might have a space rent, she's um, quite wi willing to pay rent. So please refer to the um, Church Life email um, or speak to Sarah or get in touch with Sarah for more information. Kids Holiday Club is coming up the first week of school holidays. Um, this is for kids aged kindy, so four-year-old to grade six. 
cost is $20 per child, which includes morning tea and lunch. Um, again, go to the uh, church website to register. You'll see Pastor Tim for more information. Church cleaning roster. Again, school is just in need of um, more people just to help with the cleaning roster on the alternate weekend, on alternate weeks. Um, so if you're able to volunteer, please um, contact the church office or let Sarah know if you're available. If I could ask the stewards if to take up the offering at this time. Um, if you haven't come prepared for that, please feel free. Just let the bag pass you by and we'll just hand out some bags to some stewards. Okay, Sunshine Corner and Junior Church time. If you'd like to quietly make your way out, good luck with that. It's good to see him so enthusiastic to head off to Junior Church and Sunshine Corner, isn't it? Just don't get caught in the stampede. Let's stand and sing how great is our God. to age he stands 
Debbie to come up for the um, Bible reading. Thanks. Oops. Good morning, everyone. The Bible verse reading this morning is from Ephesians 1. Chapter 15 to 23. For this reason, because I have heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Jesus Christ. When he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Thanks, Sandy. Let us stand and sing just before Pastor Tim comes to give us his message. Thank you. Yes. 
Well, good morning, everyone. It's once again great to see you this morning. Welcome if you're a visitor or a guest this morning. Welcome if you're traveling here through for rodeo. And, of course, welcome to our regulars. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, just a point, a few points just before I jump in. We, uh, at our leaders' meeting last uh, Sunday, we appointed Sarah Beer to fill in the administrative role. So welcome, uh, Sarah. And um, her normal days will be on Monday. So if you need any help with admin or anything of the like, please um, talk to Sarah on Mondays. Uh, and also I uh, caught up with Kevin Mab on Wednesday. He um, was traveling through just with some Centrelink things. Um, regrettably, he had to fly back to the Philippines on Friday, but he seems to be having a wonderful retirement there in his new exotic and tropical location, being uh, reunited with his wife, so he's uh, doing well. Uh, let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word that's authoritative and sufficient for our life and faith. We thank you that through it we come to know the truth. We thank you that you have incorporated us into your body, which is the church, and that Jesus Christ rules as the head. Amen. Uh, well, what I find wonderful about these passages as we've been going through is that Paul is here speaking about the power of Christ. We've been seeing that for the last few weeks, the power that is in Jesus Christ and the power that raised him from the dead. And Paul is not simply con content to devote one or two verses to the subject of the power of Christ, but continues after verse 19, all the way to verse uh, 23, to continue to talk about the power of Christ. And when I quickly uh, consider, or when I thought this week in preparation, powers, uh, displays of power and glory that I have seen, you know, the first thing that I thought of was, uh, well, movies that I've watched, that edited in, that have computer-generated effects, blockbuster million-dollar movies, explosions and battles, and those displays aren't even real. It's just very expensive theatre. You know, what kind of things can you think of when you think of power and glory on this side of eternity? But Paul was someone who had counted real power in the person of Christ. We see that Paul describes Christ as, having, as, as filling all in all. Now, the last several sermons, we've seen how Paul has prayed uh, that the Father would give the Ephesians the spirit of wisdom. So that's what Paul is praying. If you want to understand these things, you need the spirit of wisdom so that the Christians might know certain things and that this knowledge would ultimately translate not simply into an academic head knowledge but to knowing God. Do you know God? He prays that they may know the hope to which they have been called to. He prays that they might know the riches of the glorious inheritance that are in the saints. And he prays that they might know the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. But Christianity is more than a religion of knowledge. We may master biblical doctrine, but this shouldn't be what satisfies us. The purpose of having good biblical doctrine is so that we can know God and live in his power and be victorious over sin in this life and grow in holiness and obedience. Christianity consists, yes, of knowledge, but it's also more than knowledge, it's power from God. Without power from God, no one will become, become a Christian. Salvation is like a resurrection, a resurrection from being spiritually dead, the calling of a dead person to life, much like that of Jesus when he calls out to Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. Without God's power, no one would triumph over sin or receive the reward waiting for them in the kingdom of God. So we can see why Paul spends an extended period of time talking about uh, the a power that comes from Jesus Christ and re revealed to us in Jesus Christ that allows us to be made spiritually alive and can, allows us to stay uh, alive as well. Now, in the last few verses, the last verse we learned of the resurrection power of Jesus. Now, there are some instances, you might remember, in the Old Testament of people returning to life, centered around the work and ministry of Elisha and Elijah. 
But the norm for the millennia, for millennia, was that once you, we know this, once you die, is that you stay dead. Uh, and then Jesus arrives on the scene and says something completely absurd to the unbelieving mind. Speaking of himself, he says, they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him and after three days, he will rise. What power on earth could possibly accomplish that miracle? And the answer is obviously there's no power on earth that can raise from the dead, dead. only a divine power can do that. Uh, Only God can bring the dead to life. And on the third day, we had that great promise, that great hope that Jesus did rise from the dead, just as He said He would. And as such, God vindicated the claims of Jesus and the resurrection, declared that Jesus' atonement for sin was acceptable, and revealed that all who who were united through uh, uh, in Christ, uh, sorry, all who are united to Christ through faith can live triumphantly through that power. Because Christ lives, uh, it is not power. Sorry, because Christ lives, he shall live. But it is not power received at past salvation and future glorification, but it is seen in our present victories in this life as well. Now, we know very well that we are on a daily basis bombarded by the values of this world. The world is trying to conform us to their values. That comes through the media and the internet, from our schools and places of work. There is enticement from the flesh that draws us to our lusts and our greeds and our comforts. And then we have to deal daily with the evil one who is not to be underestimated. Uh, Our first parents who were perfect encountered the devil. Eve was deceived and Adam uh, didn't know what to do and so remained silent. And that same power that was demonstrated at Christ's resurrection is at work in us even today, giving us power to live the Christian life and overcome evil as we encounter it today. And we can be sure because of what we read of that power that continued to work in Christ's resurrection. We can be sure of the promises of our, of our sanctification, of our salvation, because of the promises that Paul tells us here, that he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also the age to come. So Christ has been, has been risen from the, from the dead. This is the foundation of our hope, and not simply from the dead, but He has been raised to the highest echelons, the highest uh, realities of this universe. We have hope because Christ rules and has authority over all earthly powers. But even more so, we know that standing behind those earthly powers our hostile spiritual powers that lead our our physical systems toward corruption and rebellion against God's law and towards tyranny. And these spiritual forces have been subject to Christ. He reigns far above those spiritual forces. I like how R.C. Sproul speaks of it. I've gone too far. How great is the power that is working within the lives of Christians. Sometimes believers feel so impotent or powerless. They see themselves as spiritual failures because the power of the flesh is so great, the temptations of the world so overwhelming, and their progress so slim. The answer to this outlook is to understand the greatness of this power. The power within us is the same as which God used when He raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in this heavenly world, in the heavenly world. In other words, Paul is referring to the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit not only raised Jesus from the dead, he raised him to the seat of cosmic authority in the universe. He raised him not only from a tomb, but from this planet to the heavenly places, where he is seated on on high as the exalted Lord of heaven and earth. End of quote. Christ has authority over every king, every president and every prime minister, over every angel, good and evil. All things have been put under the feet of Christ. And that includes the church. Christ rules this universe in the interests of what? The interests of the church. 
And it's the topic of the church that we now turn our attention to. Because here in Paul's words, we are introduced to one of the great New Testament doctrines. The church. Verses 22 and 23. He put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills all in all. And notice the metaphor or the picture that Paul uses to illustrate the church. What does he use? He uses the picture of a body, a human body. This is a term that Paul uses constantly through the writings, his writings. You know you can find this in Romans and Corinthians. And Paul prays that we would have our hearts enlightened and necessarily so as we are introduced to this doctrine of the church. In chapter 5, Paul refers to this doctrine of the church as a profound mystery. I would understand that to be something that is not easily understood. And so we need the Spirit's understanding, the Spirit's enlightening to help us understand it. And although Paul calls it a mystery later on in this book, there's no excuse for avoiding this topic. Remember, many of the people in the church of Ephesus would have been slaves from slave backgrounds, perhaps with little education. And Paul intended these people to grapple with this doctrine and uses this image of the body to help them understand. Christ rules the universe for the sake of the church. And so we need to consider what Paul would tell us about the church. And here, once again, he uses his most common metaphor, the church as the body of Christ. Now, we find other pictures in Scripture. Can you think of other things or other uh, illustrations that are used in Scripture to describe the church? Uh, Paul elsewhere uses the picture of a household with Christ as the cornerstone. In chapter 5, Paul compares the church to a bride and says that the relationship to Christ and His church is like that of a bride and a bridegroom, something we also see in the book of Revelation. Jesus, in John 15, uses the imagery of a vine and branches to refer to the church. These are all pictures to help us understand what the church is like and how it relates to one another and how it relates to Christ. But particular in the words, the church, which is His body we gain some understanding of how that power that exists in Christ comes to us uh, and, and, and how that power enables us to live lives of obedience and holiness and ever-increasing uh, conformity to Him. And that gives us hope that we'll receive the promises of, in, of the, in the inheritance of the age to come. Now, this doctrine of the church is more than academic, And not simply for pastors and elders and deacons who have responsibility over the local church. It's for us to understand so that you can know the the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe. How how does that power operate in you personally? Uh, The way that Paul helps us understand this power and how it operates in us, is he describes it uh, of our relationship to Jesus. And hence why Paul gives us the picture of a body. And there are certain principles of a body that make this illustration helpful. There's probably a number of illustrations that you can think of as well. I'm I'm not going to be comprehensive here. But first, the different parts or members and organs of a body are joined. Now, my fingers and my toes have some distance between them, uh, some separation between them but they're joined through the body. We are joined to Christ, not in a mechanical manner. Paul perhaps could have used an illustration of a chariot. The church is like a chariot or a modern-day car, but that wouldn't have uh, fitted his illustration. If the wheel comes off, well, just put another one on. The body of Christ is not a collection of loose parts that have a very loose attachment to all the other parts that can be simply replaced at ease. The uniqueness of an organic body is that Underneath the skin, underneath what you can see in front of you, in front of you and in front of me, is that underneath all of it, there's a connection, a vital connection in very intricate and vital ways. Now, my fingers are very much unlike the parts of my car, parts which can be screwed and replaced. 
Underneath the skin, you'll find veins and nerves that run to my fingers all the way up to my spinal cord and all the way to my heart. My fingers are not simply tied or screwed on. There's a living connection to the rest of my body. And to remove my finger, you have to make a, a sever, a vital connection. This is what the body illustrates. The church is made up of many parts, some which seem to be far from the other parts, but all the parts have a vital and living connection to one another. Now, we shouldn't push the analogy too hard, but we know that the vital connection of our body, when we consider those moments after contraception, uh, sorry, conception, all of the various members develop out of a, an original cell, which helps illustrate Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. There's a spiritual unity that we all share by way of our entry through the Spirit's work of regeneration into the same body. Now, I'm sure you can think of many other observations regarding this a metaphor, this picture of the human body. We don't give ourselves life, but are connected by the power and work of God. Perhaps you've noticed that your fingers don't live one day and die the next and come back to life, and die the next. Our life in Christ is not unpredictable, it's permanent. We aren't disconnected, reconnected and disconnected. A part of our body may become sick or infected. As Christians, we may backslide. But if you're in the body, I believe you'll remain in the body. Now, the second explicit principle we should he see here is the position of Christ. Where does Christ reside in this body? Well, we read in verse 22 and verse 23 that He put all things under His feet and gave Him as head as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. So, where's Christ? Well, He is the head, the head of the body and the head of the church. Now, this is an application, there's an application regarding who rules the church. Is it the pastors? Is it the elders? Uh, regrettably, in some churches, it's the person with the loudest voice and most overbearing demeanour. The Christ is stated to be the head of the church is why Protestants have rejected the Pope's rule. One of the titles of Pope is the Vicar of Christ on Earth, meaning the Pope rules the church vicariously on behalf of Christ. Now, Protestants rejected that, uh, that uh, office and rejection was written into several prominent uh, creeds and confessions like the Westminster Confession of the Faith and the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. There's one head of the church who we as Protestants say is Christ. And we emphasize this particularly as Baptists, we don't report to bishops or councils. The authority rests in the local church under Christ and under His Word. Let me read a portion of Thomas Armitage's 1886 book, A History of the Baptists, a comprehensive book of near 1,000 pages, and here he addresses how Baptists have understood church governance in relationship to Christ. The living and underlying principles of Baptist churches relate to the sovereign and absolute headship of Christ in His churches, to the exclusive authority of Scriptures as containing His law for their direction in all things, to the supernatural regeneration of each Christian forming the churches, and to the liberty and responsibility to God of each individual conscience. So Christ rules His church, and notice how Thomas Armitage says that that rule is implemented. Christ rules His church, how? Through His Word. Now, Baptists have historically been known as people of the book. We have to have a commitment to Scripture that says these words that we read are authoritative, that they are sufficient, they are inerrant. We are to be, just as the noble Bereans are, well, hopefully all Christians are, asking the question when you hear me preach, when you hear others teach, were it so? Is this true? Does this conform to Scripture? These are the foundations of Baptist church governance and Baptists have historically said Christ is head and that His Word and nothing else is authoritative and nothing is to usurp Christ and His Word. So that's the application, one application of Christ as head of the church. But even more so, Paul is wanting to emphasize is that Christ is the source and life of the local church as well. Now, in my personal body, 
It is from my head that the rest of my body obtains its direction and purpose. Even without the understanding of anatomy that we have now, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, saw the head as the perfect analogy for the position of Christ. There's no, not part, there's no part of my body, sorry, that is not controlled by my nervous system, which comes back to the head. Every muscle, every organ, every sensory receptor is connected to this vital system and traced back to the brain. And this is how we should understand Paul's depic depiction of Christ as head, uh, because in that position, he gives life to all other parts in the body. There's no independent Christian life. He is the head, we are the body, or elsewhere Jesus says, He is the vine, we are the branches. All life comes from the vital union with Christ. Now, a third principle we can make is that we can say that the same life is found in every part of the body. No part is independent. If one part of the body is sick, it affects all other parts of the body. All parts are sensitive to the others and have need of the other parts. Unity between Christians, churches and denominations can only be produced by the Spirit. And sometimes outward displays of unity don't necessarily mean that there is spiritual unity. Especially if one part has disregard for the Word of God. Any unity we have between other Christians and churches and denominations must be produced by the Holy Spirit and maintained by the Spirit. The Spirit in John chapter 16 is called the Spirit of truth. The Spirit brings unity, especially as various Christians and churches are formed around God's Word. Now, a fourth principle that we can make is that when, we, again, we read through these verses that Christ is head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all, fulfill, fills, sorry, all in all. This is a very comprehensive statement that Christ fills all in all. Now, we certainly know that Christ fills the entire universe. It's dependent on Him. It's sustained by Him. But the particular object of His fullness is the church. Paul makes a similar statement in Colossians chapter 2. For in Him, the whole fullness of deity dwells. Uh, deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in Him, who is the head of all rule and authority. So Christ is fully God, and as the body, we are filled by His power, His grace, His love. We have as our head the infinitely powerful and eternal Saviour. The church, the local church, has nothing to fear. Its hope will be realised and its inheritance received. And a fifth principle we should make is to see that the body is one, but yet consists of individual members. That's what you and I are, individual members in the body of Christ. Paul makes this observation in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make sense in any lesser part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would make it any lesser part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as He chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The primary point here is that my body consists of lesser parts and greater parts. But nonetheless, they're all essential and they all work together for one purpose. That is the proper functioning of my body. But no matter what part of the body we are, or whatever part of the body is on my body, it gains its life from my head. The church, likewise, gains its life from Christ, the head. So do you know where your life is coming from? Do you know that it comes from your connection to the body? Or are you endeavouring to live entirely apart from the body? Now, it's possible to live a good life and to do good works, but the Christian is different because they have Christ's enabling that comes through being a part of the body that allows us to live in such a way that pleases God. And that only comes through our vital connection with Christ.
Now, all of these principles and more are included in Paul's teaching that our Saviour Jesus Christ is head of the church. As you consider life and all of its difficulties, as you battle with the flesh to put your sinful nature to death, as the devil prowls seeking someone to devour, you can remind yourself of this truth. That you may feel small and insignificant. Do you feel that way sometimes? Small and insignificant? But this teaching of the body of Christ tells you that if you feel small and insignificant, but you are in Christ, you are a member of His body. And the life of Christ is in you. Christ's power is in you for obedience, for holiness, for victory over sin. And Paul has prayed that we would come to understand this, that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we may know what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. Our connection to Christ is not like the lights in my home where I flick them on and off. We are always in Him. There is a vital organic connection to our Saviour underneath the service, through the nervous system, through the veins that we can't see, but runs through all of our bodies. I like how Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, is that as our eyes are open to this truth of the body, we can take fresh courage and take up our task and again say, in Christ, I cannot fail, I must not fail, He will not allow me to fail is how we should begin to think about the church. This is not simply bricks and mortars, buildings and institutions, policies, but as sinners being transformed into saints. The church is the people of God who are being perfected as the life of Christ dwells in us. You may think of yourself as insignificant, but in Christ's body, do you know what that means if you're in Christ's body? that you are essential. As we grasp this truth and know our connection to Christ, we'll receive strength to fight our sin, strength to see our sin in a new light. It's impossible to be a member of this body and not to have a greater passion to fight our sin and see our desire for sin diminish over time. It's impossible to be a part of this body and not to lead to holiness and sanctification, where we're transformed more into the likeness of Christ, our head. And what's even more encouraging for us is that because Christ is our head, we can confidently say that many of the things that are true for Christ are also true for us. This is in Romans chapter 5, where Paul previously said that we had Adam as our head, and what's true in that instance is, is that, uh, that sin and death spread through the body. Adam sinned and we all sinned with him. But as our representative head, uh, he acted, sorry, Adam acted for all of us. But now we are in Christ and whatever the head does applies to the body. Christ was crucified and so too we have been crucified. We are dead to the old ways of our sin. Christ Uh, was crucified, I was crucified, my sin has died with Christ. But we have been raised with Christ. Christ was raised and I have been raised. I have new life. My sin is not counted against me. It's dead in the grave. And the life in us now comes from the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Paul writes, so you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. What is true for Christ is true for us. Now, we should finish with one final consideration. Namely, Paul has given us this image of the body and we've seen Christ's position as the head. And you might ask, well, what's my responsibility in all of this? Am I a passive recipient in matters of service and sanctification? You know, Christ does it all, I just sit back and do nothing. Now, while I personally have a high regard for God's sovereignty, you can be sure that we are not to be passive in this life. Uh, Paul's statement in Philippians chapter 2 makes this clear, that we are to work out your own salvation, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, 
For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. What we can say from those first few words there is that if we want to grow in holiness and obedience, is that God has given us a role. There are two extremes. One might say, well, we do it all. The other says, I do nothing and wait for Him. But Paul tells us here that there's work to do, and to do so with fear and trembling. But then he adds, for it is God who works in you, both to will and work for His good pleasure. How do we reconcile these two statements? My work and God's work. Well, consider once again the image of the body. Do you exercise through the week? Every second or third night through the week, I endeavour to do some push-ups and some sit-ups and some weights and things like that, just to build up my core strength. I'm a tall, lanky guy and my uh, core... Uh, is often feeling quite sore, all my muscles trying to hold me up. Now, my muscles are not independent from my central nervous system. My nervous system plays a, an important role in the use of my muscles. The muscles don't simply work by themselves, do they? They receive impulses from the brain through the nerves to energise the muscles as I use them. Now, if in your undisciplined an exercise state, your mass muscles will be flabby, won't they? And perhaps it even hurts simply to look at a 10 kilogram weight, let alone a 50 kilogram weight. You think, how am I going to pick that up? So what do you do? Do you just stare there looking at the weights? Is that how you make your muscles effective? Well, no, you have to pick them up, begin to exercise and develop them. If you don't exercise and think the power will be just be there when you go to pick it up, uh, you'll be sadly disappointed. You need to exercise the muscle and build it up. And the more it's exercised, the more benefit it'll be over time. The use of our muscles isn't only in the muscle or the nervous system. There's a connection. The muscle takes the impulse from the brain to move it. And even if the brain wants to pick up a 50 kilogram weight, it can't do it if the muscle is underdeveloped. And so consider this in your faith and spiritual warfare. If you find that you can't exercise your muscle in little things, then you're probably not likely to exercise that spiritual muscle in big things. And practically, this could mean for you uh, that you pray to be a godly husband which is a wonderful thing to pray for. But then ask yourself, well, do you pray with your wife? Do you pray and read the Word of God to your children? Do you make time to listen to your family and sit down and spend time with them, support them, disciple them? Do you do those things after you pray to be a godly husband or a godly wife? And practically, this means if you're struggling with lust, that we confess to the Lord and perhaps to others. Pray to God that we would be satisfied in Jesus and then limit our, your access to what is coming into your home, into your phone, through the TV, through the internet. If you struggle with gossip, have you committed it to the Lord and then perhaps before you go to a meeting, you resolve in your mind the things that you will and you won't talk about. Whatever it is, commit the matter to the Lord and then begin by building the muscle in little ways so that it grows and that you'll be over to, able to overcome bigger and bigger challenges and bigger temptations. Now, our bodies can handle great physical challenges as we exercise them, and the same is true with our spiritual muscles as well, our spiritual bodies. If your spiritual muscles are flabby, what should you do? You should exercise them. And in doing so, you'll become aware of increasing power that comes through Christ, and from Christ to obey to overcome sin, to love, to, uh, to, to forgive, to serve. You will exercise those spiritual muscles and yet then you'll discover that there is yet more power in Christ to be had. Let me just finish off by saying that you are the body of Christ and you are important to Christ for the glory of God. Let me pray. Well, Father, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you for bringing us to life with the same power that you raised your son from the dead. We thank you that we have been incorporated into the body, which is the church. 
and that you have placed Christ at the head of the church. Father, we pray that we will be obedient to His rule. Help us go to Scriptures so that we can know who we are and how to live and please your Son so that we can know the truth. We thank you that you provide your power to us to grow in faith and overcome our sin and to conform to your image. We thank you that you've promised to grow your church and that the powers of hell would never prevail against it. Help us grow, mature and prepare us as a local church, uh, a local church body that is fit for heaven. Father, we again lift up the indigenous community and people in our gathering who, in light of the hit and run death of that young girl last weekend, we pray that your peace would be with them. We commit them to you and ask that you would comfort them uh, with uh, your Holy Spirit. We pray for the Christians uh, among them, people like Topsy. Uh, we ask that they will be ministers of your gospel and grace at that d- this difficult time. Father, we lift up our missionaries to you and ask that you would give them strength to persevere and equip them with the resources they need for their ministry. And we also pray for the upcoming Kids Holiday Club and ask that it will be a wonderful time for the kids as we teach them about the gospel. Help us live godly and obedient lives for the sake of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good. Thank you, Gary. Let's stand and sing our final song.
thanks for joining us. Um, have a great week and please stay for a cup of tea and coffee. Thanks.